Welcome back to another great edition of the Cross Border Interviews with Chris Brown. I am your host, Chris Brown, and today we are talking about one of the biggest races in Canada right now, and that is the race to Stornoway. That is the leader of the official opposition, the Conservative Party of Canada, is heading into a leadership race as of April 19th. Candidates need to be announced by April 19th to officially be on the ballot for the September 10th leadership race, whenever that, wherever in Canada that is going to be held. But April 19th, that's the day that that candidates have to announce. So far to date, six candidates have put their name forward. Uh, I'm gonna get to our guest here in a second, but I just wanna name off the names here. Pierre Polidaire announced February 5th, Leslin Lewis, March 8th, Roman Babair, Bob Babair, I, I apologize if I'm pronouncing his name wrong, March 9th, former Premier John Charest, March 9th as well, Joseph Borno, Saskatchewan business owner, announced March 10th, Patrick Brown announced on March 13th, and this Sunday, so two days from now of this airing, another candidate from Perry San Muskoka, the MP, is going to be announcing as well. So we have a lot to digest. We have a lot to talk about over the next few minutes. And to do that, I'm bringing on my friend, a close friend of the family. Uh, He's been on the show probably about more times than me now, but Mr. Jeremy (laughs) Wooler. Jeremy, thank you so much for doing this on this beautiful Friday morning that we are totally airing this live. (laughs) Oh, yes. Well, all the sun is shining in Southwest calgary or southeast calgary at this time on friday morning yes here we so, go totally yes. at least someone knows how to play the game here <laughs> i sure do it's like yes the sun is totally in the right direction anyway so it's great to be it's great to be here chris it's great to be fun by the way eventually you'll get it right wool word not wool word. word but that's okay okay if anyone has listened to any of my shows this week you know i suck at names okay i have just okay. officially agreed to that i'm officially calling everyone guest one guest two and guest three so oh sweet do i get, do you get to ask me what my favorite date is going to be like like guest number one what is no. your idea of a perfect date <laughs> i guess this is, in this this is not the dating game <laughs> Oh man, geez, you could have said like, what's the what's the date for the what's the date for the deadline for the nominations there, Chris? Say that again. April a- April nineteenth. Candidates have to have so, filed. So there you go. The date of my idea of the perfect date <laughs> is April nineteenth. My nominations are filed. I'm as blue as you can get, and I promise to scrap the carbon tax and freedom. Are we officially getting a ninth candidate in this race from Calgary, Alberta? The very first Alberta-based candidate is announcing on the cross-border interviews with Chris Brown. Yeah, yeah, uh uh-huh. That's going to happen. But I appreciate the confidence that you would instill and trust in me. Actually, no one should be be asking for this. But we're just going to chat. I can tell you right now that isn't going to happen, but I appreciate the thoughts. But we are so, going to chat. We are going to yeah, chat. We- so <laughs> I'm I, I, I'm going to be the first to admit, I'm not surprised that we are in the midst of a leadership review, uh, leadership race, I should say. Uh, after the last uh, federal election, Aaron O'Toole did not gain seats. He did not grow the support that he needed to uh, turf Justin Trudeau. The knives were out, but it didn't come until February during the leadership con or the truckers convoy, the freedom convoy that descended upon Ottawa to turf Justin Trudeau, ended up turfing Aaron O'Toole. Jeremy, what did you think about the lead up to this race that was all about overthrowing Justin Trudeau, but it ended up overthrowing the conservatives instead? Well, let's... (laughs) Let's disclaim. Let me put a big disclaimer out there right here, right now. I work in I work in the trucking industry. I think that's important to mention here because the next comments are going to either going to ha- make people happy or they're going to piss some people off. You're right. So, but here we go. Here's your here's your cross here's your cross border Twitter storm right here for you, Chris. Is I think that trucker convoy was a load of crap, bona fide load of crap full stop and i honestly believe like say the result 
I'm not surprised by the result. I'm not surprised how this convoy who supposedly had gone to liberate Canada from the tyranny of putting a piece of cloth over your face, over your nose and mouth, or getting a jab, you know, to be a good responsible citizen and protect uh, others from a pandemic that is not over, despite what people might actually have you believe, was such a, <laughs> yeah, that's another conversation. But <laughs> we... We're but, gonna get banned no, like, from. I'm, you're gonna get banned from YouTube for saying stuff like that, there, Jeremy. Uh, <laughs> Again, I should say. <laughs> well, geez, all you see, all you see on me and YouTube is either workout me refing or me and workout videos. So, frankly, I'm like, have fun. You know what? <laughs> there you go. Some people will be like, just put it on an OnlyFans. I'm like, yeah, uh -huh. no, that's not gonna happen either. But no, I totally digress that we've now moved this into like the Deadpool category of uh, interviews. But no, I think the result is not not the result not the result didn't surprise me. The fact that the response from the federal conservatives regarding this convoy was so deeply polarized, uh, where you have many in the caucus, including the presumed front runner for the current leadership who are standing out here and willing to chest thumb and support what would be our, would are, are arguably Ill, were illegal uh, protest blockades. Like, yeah, not so much the act of protesting, but how they went about doing it is where you question the legalities of it. But to, stand, to have someone there standing there and supporting it and then having the leader of the federal conservatives, the leader of the official opposition, taking a more moderate tone that some of the hard right and some of the hard base uh, were simply, no, this doesn't work. We can't have this. Then dump them? Oh yeah, like they wanted, they needed a reason to dump them. They needed a reason for it. They didn't want O'Toole. As you said, he didn't produce the results that the party wanted and they, need, and they needed a reason to let him go. But no one wanted the optics of having another leadership review and another leadership contest. So this happened to just give them something that they desperately needed, an excuse. So it played well. It didn't, like say, Justin Trudeau is still prime minister of Canada. And like say, uh, Candace Bergen there, not Murphy Brown, but the other Candace Bergen decide to like, get my way to start away, move, move, move. It's like, I need to be in here, queen, get out of here, right? And now we're, going to see who is going to be the new torchbearer and see who's going to go up against the prime minister again and um like none are, of it surprises me chris are the conservatives doomed to repeat history though because we in politics today unless you're the ndp i would say the greens but we all saw what happened with anime paul but we see the ndp if you lose the first time you're out with the NDP, if you lose the first time, we'll give you another shot, then we'll give you another shot. We'll give you another shot until you decide to leave. Are the Conservatives going to wake up one day and officially say, okay, maybe one and done is not the right way forward? The Liberals did it as well. The Liberals did it with Stefan Dion. The Liberals did it with Michael Ignatieff. Are the Conservatives doomed to repeat history if they don't get a leader this time that is in it for the long haul and not just in it for one potential election and then see the conservative caucus revolt because they didn't bring them back to power. Well, you're, you, I, you highlighted, you highlighted the distinction right there, Chris. It's not about for the federal conservatives being a one and done. It's not, not even, that's not the question that we should be asking. The question should be asking is the conservative party of Canada ever going to get its crap together and actually figure out a vision for the future besides beating Justin Trudeau. Like that's their only MO. Their apparatus Mundi is beat beat the true beat the Trudeau liberals. And you know what? You can maybe galvanize of an electorate to go with that. But at the end of the day, it becomes a Potemkin village that is just doomed for failure. Like we all know the analogy of the Potemkin village. It looks great, looks fancy, but when you go behind the scenes, it's just it's hollow. There's nothing of substance there. So it might sound great 
as a chest thumping campaign speech, it might sound great to an electorate that feels disenfranchised or frustrated that the uh, true that the Trudeau government has chosen to modify um, their platform and modify their policy positions, contrary to what they chose to run on and were elected based on those policies, or in many ways got themselves stuck in their own in their own quagmires of their own making, right? People feel disenfranchised. Yeah, they might be able to go for that for the long haul. But unless there's something there, unless the Conservative Party of Canada can actually present a vision of the future that actually is true to the core tenets of what, you know, conservatism should look like, then, yeah, it's just going to be it's just going to be a rinse, a, a, a rinse, repeat. We look at it in Alberta. Look at it. Look at it here and now. Like, I don't mean I don't I know this is a, a federal talk. Well, we got to let's call let's call a spade a spade. Yeah. Alberta's the Bush League. Like, honestly, it's the Bush League of federal conservative politics. Like you watch you watch the junior league players play here. And then they get promoted, they get promoted to the big, get promoted to the big times. Or in the case of some, they think, oh, well, we're going to come down and enhance the homegrown talent. And it blows up spectac spectacularly in their faces, which is what we're seeing evidence of today. So you can't talk about one without talking about the other. And I will be drawing a couple analogies to this during the course of this conversation. But yeah. The issue isn't whether the leaders won or done. It's the issue is, is the vision of the party sustainable in the long term? And honest to goodness, Chris, I don't think it is. And they have to have a sit down, come to whatever deity they want to moment and recognize that, shit, this isn't working. Like we're not gaining the traction we want because we're, we don't have anything else besides slogans and that's and that just stems into another conversation is what is conservatism in canada these days that's another and i say that would be the next in my mind that's the next question you have to ask what we pride ourselves on going beyond that 15 second sound bite be sure to hit that subscribe button today to be kept in the loop of all the great episodes that are coming up on the show also Click on the links in the show notes and follow our social media pages as well. Well, it, it, it's a good segue into the next set of questions I want to ask. And that is, after Harper, Harper was able to keep the coalition together. We talk about the coalition and parties. The liberals have a coalition of the left and the center. The, the conservatives have a coalition of the center and the right. Stephen Harper was able to hold that together. Andrew Scheer tried to, but it didn't really work out. And he wasn't able to build that center coalition and bring back the Harper Conservatives to the fold. And then they went in the 2020 election with Aaron O'Toole, who brought the party more to the center and forgot about those right supporters who left towards uh, Maxine Bernier and the People's Party of Canada. Now, this this leadership is do we go back to the extreme right do we stay in the center it's about kind of and i know this is the analogy that a lot of people have used and it's the worst analogy ever ever but it's about the soul of the party what vision does the party want to hold and will they be able to sell that vision and hold on to that vision because after uh, sheer left andrew sheer the leader in the 2019 election the party basically said that that policy book that that the whole platform that we ran on completely out to left field now we don't believe in it 2021 that po that platform we don't believe in it anymore we're completely this new party and everyone knows who we are and we're just the the true conservative party is this leadership race about where the party needs to go or is this leadership race about who has the bigger manhood in some sense <laughs> should have just said it chris like, <laughs> i was going go. to but i was like ah don't pull it back oh man if it's the world reverse i would have oh i would have totally said it. But, anyway. <laughs> but no but if you think about it my friend you just identified exactly and you know what? i know you hate the analogy but it's the right analogy because if you think about it there are three different versions of conservatism at play yeah so you have your neoconservative movement 
which uh, is defined as former liberals that have now turned conservative. Like this was the highlights of the Reagan years, the Ronald Reagans, the Margaret Thatchers, which is where you're going to like... You're going to see the Reagan Democrats. You're going to see the uh, Labor uh, Thatchers. You're going to see yeah. the, like conservatives who su- get the support of soft left supporters. Yeah. So, yeah. And you see, there's support that you're going to be, you're, you're going to support, you're going to have the support of the state. You're, they're going to, they're, they're going to, they're going to want a greater role in the sen- in the state in executing policy but they're still going to trump those whole things of open markets, deregulation, everything else. And they're going to pander, they're going to cater to both sides of that, of that equation and hope like heck it works. And in Alberta, it worked from 93 to 2005. That was Ralph Klein. Ralph Klein ESA was defined and he was defined in my 2000 social studies 30 textbook as an Alberta version of a neoconservative. Look at his history. That's what you see. So that's one part of the party in play. The second element of the party is the social conservatism. Now, this is your true blue reform. These are your Manningites. These are old those... reformers, old Canadian Alliance members. Yeah. yeah. Members of the reform party. <laughs> yeah, from Calgary. There you go. All right. We gotta have we gotta have at least have a Manning job in there somewhere. But these are your who inherently collapse uh, the role of conservatism and the role of faith, morals, everything else. Now I'm saying, I'm saying here, there's nothing wrong with believing in something. There's nothing wrong in having your own values. The issue here is that the social conservative movement wants to have those values and those morals imposed as law. That is the intervention they are looking for. That's where they're thinking that that moral responsibility that given authority to govern those type of policies has an impact and at the same time promote those same thing of let's say fair capitalism unchecked unchallenged and this is where we're running into a lot of issues because this is where your populists like to reside whether they're true populists whether they're populists in sheep's clothing i don't particularly care what you call them but this is where this is where you're getting into, and this is the element that is hard. This, this, the social conservatives are the hardest element to nail down. The third element, which is where I would like to say I fancied myself this at one time, in many ways I still do, are the progressive conservatives. So this is your, these are your Joe Clarks. These are your, hey, this is say, these are your Jean Charest's. These are your Peter Lawheeds. These are those who recognize that an entrepreneurial spirit and the ability to provide for oneself and for one's family of your own ability is paramount. But at the same time, you have a responsibility as stewards, if you want, if you will, to take care of those less fortunate, to build a, to build a system that doesn't marginalize that doesn't that doesn't discriminate that you're thinking into the future you're thinking what are future generations going to inherit from the fruit of our labors in the here and now now for me to talk like that you're like oh that sounds like a social conservative thing to say i'm like well maybe but you know what that's how i just see the world but no it's quite isn't it another conversation another deep dive for another day you and i but honestly like I do base a lot of my po- political positions, opinions, values. You know what? My faith does help inform some of it, but I look at it from a rather pr- progressive point of view yes. that it's not a crime to make sure that you have means to take care of the poor. It's not a crime to be able to say, if you can't work, then we're going to help you. We're going to empower you to learn the skills, to get the education you need that you can work and we're not just going to leave you to fend for yourself. We're also thinking of that environmental responsibility. How are we going to, in- what are we going to use with the revenues that we collect from the resources that we have and that we're bringing to market? Like this is, that was the Her- that was the heritage fund. That was Lockheed, that was Lockheed's vision of that. And in the federal progressive conservatives, despite whatever, 
going to say, despite whatever you'd like to say, some of them got it right during the years of progressive conservatism. There's a reason why Joe Clark, despite all the fun little jokes and quirks and memes and anything else you want to say, there's a reason why Joe Clark's respected as a statesman. Because Joe Clark knew how to get that done and knew how to see that, see that vision. And Jean Charest, in his own way, kind of heralds back to that. But circling back to what we were talking to your original question, the soul of the party, these three factions are very different from each other. They all have diff the only thing they have in common, really, is the word conservative in their title. It means some means something very different to each different group. And the and the thing is, is until they can figure out which one of these they actually want to have win the day, you're going to see this happen again. You're going to see your camp show up and it might work for an election cycle or two, but eventually the stick's going to get old. Like it's not, it's not sustainable. Like if you're trying to think of something where, per, let's say policy, you know what? Let's just throw, let's just throw it out there. Carbon pricing. Let's talk about it. We're talking, about car we're talking about carbon fees, carbon levies. Let's use Alberta. Alberta was the first to come up with their own one. They had a, they had a plan in place for large, for large polluters back in 2007. This is like a Stelmac thing. Okay. But they saw the need then to recognize that, you know what? You have, if you're going to pollute, you have a price to pay. There's a social responsibility there. Now, the idea of any, the idea of any tax or levy, right? is that you pay for use. Yeah. If you don't use it, you don't pay. The idea of it is, is that, you know what, you could actually make it profitable in the long run if, there, if there's a reason to, incent to incentivize it, to actually give some perks and to actually, you know, raise profit. I don't know, invest in something, invest, invest in a future, let that generate. You, if you're, if you're talking about that laissez-faire laissez-faire capitalist and mindset, you can use a policy to help promote and protect an environment to mitigate the cost of, to mitigate the impact of climate change and also still make some money on it. So, but you, they've regressed the policy to nothing more than it's bad and evil without having any frame of mind. Like, Let's put it, let's hear. I'll give you another one there, Chris, just to add for your context here. Jim Prentice, okay? Bless his soul. I actually quite, actually quite liked the guy. But Jim Prentice had it right. If Jim Prentice had managed to stay premier of Alberta and implemented his own carbon pricing, it would have been very similar to the one we saw with the, not, with the Notley government. If you read his book, yep. which, I, which I have and love, like I read Triple Crown, you would have seen that form. And Prentice understood that. And that is why, despite some of the hubris, it would have been, it would have been a tangible for the conservative voter. Sorry, if it was presented in such a way. But nobody in, in the federal caucus is talking about it like that now. All you hear is scrap the carbon tax, scrap the carbon tax. It's like, but what are you actually doing? Like you're chopping off your foot to spite your face. But again, you're not like, say, it's not pragmatic. These approaches are not pragmatic. And there are three very, say, three different conflicting views. And this is just one example that where the federal conservatives can't agree. And if they can't agree, how the hell do they expect the, uh, the, the, the electorate to be behind it? You're going to have one candidate that's going to say, maybe we should consider this. You're going to have another that says, no, we're not going to do this. And then you're going to have some in the background saying, hey, guys, um, I kind of want to live to my 80s and not have to deal with, like, you know, acid rain or extreme drought or extreme fires or floods, whatever you want to call it. Maybe we should be doing something. And they get proverbially tossed out the window, just like those memes, like, how do we do to get home? Uh, maybe go on side quests. Maybe consult with our spirit animals. Maybe not do side quests and just stray home and get <coughs> tossed and get tossed out the window. So, or the airlock, whatever you want to call it. There, like that's that's what I watch, and that's why it frustrates me to no end. 
that the current Conservative Party of Canada can't get its shit together. We pride ourselves on going beyond that 15 second soundbite by becoming a backer of the show. With a quick visit to patreon.com and searching cross border interviews, you can help continue this show. For as little as $3 a month, your support can ensure we grow and bring new and exciting things to our growing listenership. Click the link in the show notes and back the show today. Because they have a role to play. But they need to figure out what that role is. So you bring up a lot of good questions now because you have, in your scenario, there's three different conservative parties and there are six candidates, seven as of Sunday, running for this leadership. Mm -hmm. I, I can pinpoint each one of these seven candidates into one of those three categories. And that's a large umbrella. How do you win a general election when your base is one third of your party? Because if I'm going to the general electorate, I'm assuming I have the backing of my party, the full party, not just 33% of the party, but the full party. Trudeau has done this significantly well. He is able to get the left and the right together and say, hey, stick with me and we'll win. We see this leadership race becoming a slugfest and they are attacking each other like it's a general election. Like I've never seen a leadership race in my life. And I've only been around since the early 90s when I first got involved in politics. So I wasn't around during the uh, Turner Pierre years. So I could be wrong. But the more Pierre and John Charest and Patrick Brown attack each other, the more divided the party is going to be. So I, I, the, 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 million, the, the question that I have to ask is, is, is winning at all costs going to be detrimental to the party and to the future of the Conservative Party? You might want to call, you might want to call Jason Kenny and ask him that question <laughs> because that's the same. No, it's exactly that. And I'm going to use that as the framing the point to this answer. I'm going to totally use it because I was there. I watched it. I was part of it. I let's start. Let's just start. Let's just rehash some history here. 2016, November 2016 in Red Deer. Okay. We're not even a month into this thing. We're at a policy meeting and Kenny and his supporters accost Sandra Gansick. They threw the most disgusting obscenities in her way. They tear down posters. They call her a baby killer. They call her a bunch of other stuff like truly disgusting comments. Sandra leaves. Sandra went to join the NDP. Boom. There's one group of voters gone, right? Well, I wouldn't say all, all of the progressives left at that time because no, you, still, they, you, you still had people like Starkey in the... Uh, the oh, the I know. Area. And that's why I'm, I'm getting to that. Don't, worry, don't get me wrong. Okay. I'm, I'm getting to that. I'm sure... Yeah, no, you're right. Because just you chronological I, ordering it. <laughs> well, yeah, because you and I were there, Chris. We saw it. We were we were there. And so yeah, so Sandra left left a huge, left a huge impact. Like that definitely left some ricochets. But yeah, and then you have Richard Starkey, bless his soul, one of the nicest people you're ever gonna meet. And honestly, he's the only politician I've actually had in my home. I'm Aww. friends with a bunch of them, but he's the only one I've actually had in my home. And I love it because him and his wife are just like the best people I've ever met. Love I, them. I really need to have him on this show. I'm going to send you really do. Out. But you have Richard Starkey. You have Stephen Kahn. Rick you Frazier. have, yeah, you, well, well, and Byron Nelson. We're the other, we're the other candidates, right? Uh, Donna Kennedy Glenn's she, she left. Um, her story was a very interesting one. I don't necessarily want to divulge, go digress into it because I have my own feelings there. But anyway, but now you're left with you're left with Khan, Starkey, Nelson, and Kenny. Yeah. Okay. So what happens then is like they take out the number one threat because Sandra Jansen was a number one threat. The NDP did not want Sandra Jansen as a PC leader in 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 2016. They're the oh she is the only one 
who the NDP actually ran attack ads are. And I actually remember one of them. It was kind of crazy. It was the internet one. It's like Sandra Jansen said what? And uh, she was the only one, only one that actually they actually ran banners against because they had always even openly admitted we were scared. If Sandra Jansen became the leader of the PCs in 2017, we were scared because Sandra could have galvanized that vote and made a very different turn of phrase. But my point, I digress. I'm not going to go back. Back on track. That was my squirrel moment. You now have Kenny. Yeah. You now have Kenny and you now have these three moderate progressive conservatives. Okay. Yeah. The anti, the anti gets up and go and gets higher. Like now, here we go. The Kenny's goons, whatever you want to call them, because I will call them goons, because that's exactly what they are. They raise the bar. They get ugly. They get nasty. The attacks on social media persist. Anyone who was even remotely identified as a left Tory or as a uh, red Tory, sorry, were accosted, insulted, ridiculed, accused of being insiders and elites, that we were subverting the will of democracy. Yeah, that was a hot take from uh, the spouse of the current Minister of Municipal Affairs in Alberta. Oh yeah, I enjoyed I enjoyed uh, ending her time at the mic during that delegate contest. I'll forever be proud of that. Was, she got a very loud stop at my end. Oh yeah, I wasn't having any of that crap. But anyway, but we that's what we put up with. And it got and then we get to March. The delegates are all selected. We all know that the end has come. And then what do Kenny's people do? They just make it even worse. They go to vote. I was working the ballot box that day. I had coup de tug George Clark show up. And to my face, he's like, you know what? You really think you need to count this box? It's like in two hours when this is all done, people like you are no longer welcome here because we're taking over and we're going to take back Alberta. Oh, yeah. Wonder how George Never Clark's heard. doing these days. <laughs> George Clark now is, well, he's going around and telling people how they should uh, save Kenny. And it's like, well, George Clark can go kiss my fat ass and there's plenty of it to kiss. So there you go, George, line up, pucker up. There's two hemispheres there. You might, might as well enjoy one of them. But anyway, so, but, here, but here you go. Kenny's coronated. The next day, they drag Troy Wayson out. The executive director of PC Alberta publicly demand his resignation. Like an embarrassing moment board leaves then there's a few stragglers behind but the damage has been done yeah. they've now kenny's consolidated this base he's consolidated his camp but the point of all of that is it was a marriage of convenience it was very much his whole message was beat the ndp to end the notley trudeau alliance and he managed to round up the wild his wild rose supporters those conservatives who enjoyed being at the public trough for so many years and rally them together but they're two very different parts of the party you now have the he essentially removed the progressive conservatives from the mix and he's left with neoconservatives and he's left with social conservatives and frankly the two groups don't like each other they don't no. by virtue by virtue they don't that's just some <laughs> of those historical trends look at Let's just use again. Let's use Ralph Klein. Ralph Klein called Jason Kenney an asshole. He was not a fan of our current of our current premier. He probably wouldn't be a fan of him today if he were still alive. Those and now you're watching those two groups implode, and Kenney's coalition is imploding around him. So, sure, you know what? The federal conservatives can go and play the same game. You know what, Pierre? Let's just use Pierre because let's just for intents and purposes. He's the voice. He's the poster child. Everyone's. He's the front runner. And I think a lot of people know that. And I think a lot of people are under the impression that it's his to lose. And it we, is his. To we said that about uh, Maxine Bernier. We said that about Peter McKay. So you never know what could happen on uh, September 10th, but it's his to no. lose. So, yeah. So let's just, ar let's just argue for sake, all things equal. It's Pierre's, it's Pierre's to lose. Pierre is of the same cloth as the Jason Kennys, the Stephen Harpers, that social conservative that just hovers the line. 
you know, the ambiguous ones, the ones that can flutter between one or the other, uh, can change the spots if you need to, like a leopard that can change his spots based on where, based on how the mood suits him. I just so find Peter, it funny that a lot of people have forgotten the fact that Pierre Polivier worked in Jason Kenney's Ottawa office for a few years before getting elected as an MP in Carleton. Because oh, yeah. you have to remember, Pierre is from Calgary, Minnipore, which Jason Kenney represented up until he left to go save Alberta. So maybe they are cut from the same loincloth. <laughs> well, as much as I like, say, I was like, I made a gab here, don't all make any jabs at my sport. But then when I found out that Pierre Paul was a Calgary wrestler too in high school and stuff, I'm just like, wow. Okay. So now your joke just makes you even more funnier. So <laughs> um, uh -huh. I'm going to be, I'm going to, I'm going to go, I'm really burned for that one. But anyway, I digress <laughs> here. Um, but no, but they say Pierre is cut from that cloth, that Harper cloth, that Kenny cloth. That is who he is. That's where people are putting so much faith in that because they're trying to recreate what happened with Harper. That's what they want. That's what a lot of the base wants. And that is why Pierre is going to get a large pass on some of the crap that's going on, like the attacks, Patrick Brown, like some of the stuff that's going on between him and Patrick Brown right now. It's like, oh my gosh, you two. I like what it. the, <laughs> well, you know what? I don't, it's like debate a policy, debate an issue. Kenny did the same thing in the leadership race too, where you have Starkey, Khan, Nelson. At this point, it was just Starkey and Nelson with uh, Kenny in that final run up to uh, the convention in Calgary, right? The February debate at the Legion Hall, the birthplace of the NDP of all places. And Nelson and Starkey are asking questions. And then here's Kenny running up to the mic and trying to change the channel and be like, but this, but this, I'm like, answer the flipping question it's like debate the issue stop making it about you like oh my gosh drama queen stop it but they're gonna get a pass he got a pass that because it was his to lose because that's what the base wanted that social conservative base and that sign if you're gonna be blunt that is the problem of the of the of the modern conservative party is the so is that social conservative reform element yeah and i'm gonna leave that there and i will die on that hill i you want go ahead sorry i'm just gonna say and i don't want to digress here because i don't want your viewers to think oh my gosh jeremy's never getting to the point like maybe you should be a politician but no the point i'm trying to make here is that pierre's gonna get that pass he's gonna it's gonna let it slide because the base knows what the base wants the base wants a guy with gusto and enthusiasm that can get the job done the problem is they don't think about how far it's going to go in the future. They're not thinking long term. They are not think. They're not thinking about how do we sustain this over five, 10, 15 years. Maybe that's too long. But they're not thinking long term. They're thinking in the here and now. They're thinking getting rid of Justin Trudeau is going to solve all the problems. That. If we have another Stephen Harper, every issue, everything wrong in Canada is going to go away. Look, look at Alberta. That was the same mentality that people had with the with Kenny and and the and the UCP. Oh, we're going to get rid of the Notley NDP. All of our issues will go away. They never left, and in fact, the issues became further exacerbated. Like COVID just ended up shining a light on a lot of the. Uh, a lot of the uh, supports of the UCP Potemkin village, you realize it was nothing but hollow promises and false hope. So I like say it might be peers to lose, but unless they can, unless they can come up with something you know, a lot more coherent and actually rally the party, not just that 33% and actually figure out how to bring those L those three elements together, you're, gonna you're gonna see you're gonna you're gonna see another trudeau win it might be his last but you're gonna see another liberal win and heaven help the conservatives if uh christia freeland is re it replaces justin trudeau as the leader you know what there's enough populist idea there and popularity there that nah, she can make she can make things interesting so she could um, they could
but that's another topic for another day. That When the leadership race for that kicks off, we'll have you back on for that one. Yeah, sounds good. We, uh, the, the idea that Pierre is going to cakewalk this in has a lot of people concerned in the party. A lot of the old PCers, the, a lot of the statesmen, as we say, Let's be honest, and I think you and I will both agree with this. John Charest's leadership campaign so far has been so much of a dud that I I went to the event. I thank God, knock on wood, didn't get COVID-19. But it has been so lackluster that is the populist conservative movement that is the neoconservative, the social conservative is that more attracting and more energetic to people than the old progressive Brian Mulroney uh, politics? Because I'm looking at it right now. I'm looking at it as, okay, if I was to vote for a leader tomorrow, which one would I want? Would I want the person who is spewing the, the, the sound bites on social media? Or would I want someone who's going to talk to me about policy and talk to me like I'm an adult and not just talk above me? I don't see either one of them in that category. I like I I know as I say that I have two John Charest signs behind me, but I do have a Pierre Polivare button on me. So for those who are about to say you're talking out of your ass, pardon my friend. <laughs> <laughs> but is someone like a John Charest even welcome in the party anymore? Like I don't see a lot of people even rallying around him to say we want you to be the next leader. Or am I just thinking, okay, it's still how many days until uh, 30 days, almost 30 days to the day when this is airing till the next, till, till you have to announce. And then that's when things actually get interesting. Or am I just out to left field? You know what? I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to say this. I'm going to be blunt. You know what? I'm kind of glad it's just you and I recording on this friday morning that somehow has gotten a little bit more overcast and dark yeah but totally not in this room which my yeah, lights are totally off yeah i'm gonna say something and people are gonna at me people are gonna be pissed but you know what i'm just gonna say it. the wrong person is running for the party you want an answer there is an at there is an mp in the party right now that could actually galvanize and mobilize all three elements of that party and make it a viable contender to the Trudeau liberals. And as much as people are going to hate it and are going to hate me for saying it, here it is. The MP that should be running and who I would actually be inclined to vote for if I were a card-carrying member of, of the CPC is the MP for Calgary Nose Hill. Boom. Drop the mic right there. Because Michelle Rempel Garner, for all of her little social quirks and for some of her takes are not necessarily the best Mich Mich uh, sorry chris here i got pause here oh i didn't realize how late i didn't realize how late we were anyway sorry no that worries. is um sorry anyway you're recording for my phone in 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 the car here but no the mp no michelle michelle's the person that could get it done because michelle's the only adult in the room michelle she showed that leadership quality that the Conservative Party of Canada has truly been lacking for a long time in her piece when she called out the critics and opportunists in her party about the WEF. And she's like, screw you all. You're all full of shit. She and still could announce. Don't get me wrong. She still could announce. And I still think there's going to be a, a consensus candidate that does announce here shortly. Okay. But I would agree. Michelle would be a strong contender and she could possibly give Pierre an actual run for his money. Yeah. You know what? If it were, yeah, Jean Charest, for all the good that Jean Charest has done in the past, this isn't the 90s anymore. His time, it's not the same political environment. For him to come out of the woodworks like this and run, just speaks and again i don't want to knock him because he's a good guy and i don't want to knock his memory but it has the same feel as print as jim prentice coming back to alberta to run for the leader of the uh, provincial pcs like I, it's the I, same 
Go ahead. It's the same ambiance. It's the I same have, take. I have been saying that for about a week and a half since Sheree came to Calgary. I, yeah. I, I chalked it up to this. 1997, John Sheree left politics, federal politics, to go run in Quebec for the uh, Quebec Liberals. He was the yeah. sitting uh, conservative, progressive conservative leader. The yeah. person who won that leadership after was the right honorable Joe Clark. It was his second run at the leadership, and he was going to take the party back into power. And for all that it's worth, he was yesterday's man. And I say that with all respect to Joe Clark because I respect him. I would love to have him on the show. But when Joe Clark won in 1997, the progressive conservatives became the progressive conservatives of Brian Mulroney and Joe Clark of 79. If yeah. Sean Charest wins, the conservatives become the conservatives of 1993 and he is yesterday's man. I think he's going to do incredibly well. I hope he potentially does well and gives at least a, an actual race and not just a coronation. But I think John Charest is the Joe Clark of 1997. Oh, absolutely. 100%. It's not what you need. It's not what you need. No. It's not what the party needs right now. The party needs new faces. The party has new faces. The party has new values. And honestly, the political environment that we're all so diamet also insistent on having our diametric, like, I don't think that's not even the right, not even the right verbiage there, but our views, their views of left and right, like say those, that paradigm of what is left wing, right wing, the center anymore, we're still basing it on 1990s terms, but the world is very different 30 years later. It's like, it's no longer, it's no longer left and right. I don't, I'll be, and I'll be blunt to say that. It's like your narrative has become more an idea of values-based politics as opposed to ideological-based politics. Those who still insist on the damn purity tests and gatekeeping, whatever the case may be, right? They're going to try and hold to that. But you know what? They're clutching a pearl that no longer exists. I hate to say it. It, no, that, it has no relevancy in this, mod, in, in this modern dialogue. So if you want to label conservatives, you got to really go back to the drawing board and define what does this actually mean? And honestly, every political party has to go do that. Every the time there's a new leader, there's, that, they have to do that, right? Well, I'm just saying, even now, it's like, have the willingness to take a look at yourself and realize that you're representing a dynamic population that doesn't say stay stagnant. Our population is changing. Our values are shifting. That is a reality of, a current, of our current world. And if we continue to keep looking at it like it is uh, post-World War II Europe or post-World War II world, right? or the post-Cold War, it, you're missing so much of the nuance. And in this, and this, modern, and this, modern, conser in this modern conservative movement, this modern conservative movement scares me because it's not at all what conservatism really should look like if you're going to go, if you're going to go to a book. And I know I just 30 seconds ago talked about a gatekeeping and, a pure, and, a, and the purity test, but I think at some point you have to have some standard. You have yours, but the standard, but the standard shifting. Yeah, I know, I know, I know. Who has help. standards in this day and age? Come on. Well, no, you have to stand for something. But the problem, but the thing is, though, is that even when you're standing for something, there is room for nuance. And that nuance doesn't exist. People want absolutes. People want something so easy. They don't have to think about it. And that's what they're getting in this in this leadership race that's what they're getting and i believe the candidates and really it's sheree and pa and Polly i don't even really know the other ones really because and that's another warning sign that's like this is not going the way it should because you don't know who these people are you only know who two of them are yesteryear and jason kenny 3.0 but whatever you want to call it like they're not offering me anything of substance they're no. offering me clickbait head clickbait headlines and i'm like that doesn't that doesn't help me doesn't help me as someone who's looking to plant a vote no exactly. doesn't help well they don't have to worry about my vote anyway because i don't think i'm going to even vote for them right now well actually i know for a fact that i won't and haven't for a few years but if they wanted to actually make an effort 
you really got to look and say, okay, great. Let's take a look. Let's take the ideology away. Let's take a look at what we stand for. What is it we stand for? And if we want to blanket that, if you really want to pull the wool and pull the bandaid off and be like, okay, you know what? New world. Let's stop clutching the safety blanket. Let's just freaking go all in. Look at your values. Where are they? Now, you know what? You're going to find the values spread across different spectrums. You can take those and shape them to be your own. But the reality is, is people are going to look for what you stand for. People are going to look for something. And honestly, Pierre doesn't inspire that. Sheree doesn't inspire that. And like I said, I stand by what I said, and I'll take the flack for it. The spider quirks, the spider flaws. Garner? Oh, yeah. She know. She knows what she stands for. She genuinely gets it. She's not necessarily the most tactful, but you know what? Some of the most powerful women are never ta are never the tactful ones. They always say, it's like, you know what? Never listen to a, like a quiet woman. All the fierce ones were the best shit disturbers and we love them for it. That's why people like, in my world, the Shannon Phillips, the Sandra Jansons, they're the ones I love because you know what? They don't take shit from anyone. And that's, and that's Michelle. She is the conservative version of these, of these two, of these two women whom I very much respect and admire. And she has her own flair. Does she, does there hyperbole? Of course there is, but there's hyperbole everywhere. Come on, let's just be real. But no, let's be but she real. also has, <laughs> but she has the savvy to get things done. And that's where I, will make my will make my stand. And if the modern conservative party of Canada can figure themselves out, it's like like fix yourself for your wreck yourself type of idea. They really need to fix themselves. You know what? If they really need to sit in the penalty box for this one till for another four years, then do it. Take the time. Honestly Actually get, get it, it right. right. Yeah. Get it right. Literally because we saw in Alberta that's what happened with the UCP. They didn't get it right. It it was a marriage of convenience. It was a rush coalition. Sure, they got their short-term results, but now, as um, as uh, Kenny's, or some people are calling Kenny's Brutus, decides to write a skating piece, I just call him. I just call him the golden cut of Alberta politics. Or it's like you just saw which way the wind was blowing and shifted sides. It's like it was a good idea at the time. It's like yeah, so. With Blaze, with Blaze Bomer writing his scathing piece, he's like, the experiment that was the United Conservative Party might be coming to an end. And I'm like, in my mind, I'm like, no shit, Sherlock. <laughs> That's you guys built this thing like that. It was doomed to fail. We told you this five years ago. And I honestly see the modern conservative party going that way. If you're talking about unity all the time, staying united, unite the party, you're not united. Let's be real. You're not. True. So, no. but I know there. And I just got to say for the record here, I am way over time. <laughs> no worries. No worries. Uh, I want to thank you for doing this, Jeremy. Greatly appreciate it as always. Um, while we are only two weeks into this official leadership race, I know, Jer uh, not Jeremy, but uh, Pierre Paul Hiver announced earlier in February, the official race didn't really get underway until about middle of the beginning of March when all the candidates started out to announce. We are still 30 days away from that cutoff time when candidates have to announce. So I'm expecting probably about three or four more MPs or former MPs or former premiers or whoever to announce. Um, politics in Alberta is going to be interesting in those next 30 days because we have a leadership review on the 9th of April as well. So April is like amazing times for us here in uh, podcast world. Um, but Jeremy, thank you for doing this. This is always fun to have you on and talk about politics. We will have you back on again to sort of do a running tally of this conservative leadership race as it unfolds. And um, I, it seems like it's getting overcast over there in uh, Southwest Calgary on this beautiful Friday morning. Uh, but thank yeah. you so much for doing this. You're very, you're very welcome. And I actually look forward to doing your, uh, post April 9th runoff with you because that's bound that's bound to be a lot of fun there you go uh before we do go I do want to just mention that this is our very first podcast that we're mentioning this on we do have official merch now on the good old crossborderinterviews.ca website <laughs> so if you want to you can head over and get the official crossborder interviews 
uh, notebooks, uh, 250 pages of notes with our beautiful button collection on them. So <laughs> we have NDP, we have PCs, we have Alberta NDP, we have Alberta PC button collection uh, notebooks that you can go in. They're $15 each. Uh, they will go towards you. They ship from Amazon. If you want to buy them from our website directly, they're a little bit cheaper. So head over to crossboarderinterviews.ca, pick one up for you, for your political lover in your family. It's always fun. Jeremy, as always, a pleasure and an honor to talk with you. Have yourself an excellent rest of your day. And remember, guys, get out from behind that social media feed. Get out from behind Twitter. Get out from behind Facebook and have a conversation with somebody. It is uh, helping our democracy when we actually chat to each other. Surprise, surprise. So go out and do that. Go out and have a conversation because it makes us better as people. Have yourself an excellent rest of your days, guys. Happy and Friday, everyone. Happy Friday. And we will be back on Monday morning, guys. Talk to you later.